after each case I try, the only real area that I critique myself on is what is, or what was, the verdict for pain and suffering. Because let's face it, the economic numbers are the economic numbers. Sure, there's ways to present those numbers with charts and to do it in a persuasive and effective way. But as far as pain and suffering, there are no charts. It's advocacy. If you look at the jury charge in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, other states, there are these abstract terms. The worst thing a juror could ask you if you do speak with a jury, a juror after verdict is, well, we really didn't know how, we really didn't know how much to award for pain and suffering. We really didn't understand it. That's the advocate's job, to make them understand it. It's our job to equate money with pain and suffering, loss of life's pleasures. Hopefully by the time you get to your damage argument, you've built up some heat. Because my partner and I, Jason Daria, that's one thing we try to do in our discovery and then at trial with the jury is to try to build up heat. Because if you can build up heat, if you can get the jury angry, your verdict will invariably be higher. When those jurors get back in that jury deliberation room, I want them to be thinking about non-economic damages. I want them to be thinking, what would a lifetime of pain be worth if this happened to me? What would never being able to do something I love to do before the accident be worth to me? And if you can get them talking about that in the jury room, you've accomplished your goal. So I want to try to empower the jury about how it's up to them and how it's a real enormous responsibility that is placed in their hands once I sit down. Part of empowering the jury, or what I try to establish, is make them understand that it is my client, my family's only day in court. They've been waiting for two, three, four years for us to get where we are now. And can't come back. This is it. The verdict must be such that it covers the plaintiff, client, and family for lifetime. The first item of non-economic damages, we all know about pain and suffering. Past and future. Two lines on the verdict sheet. Past and future. I'm just going to provide some examples of, these are all real life examples of arguments of pain and suffering. Under the law, John Jones is entitled to be compensated every day, every hour, every minute, every second that the defendant's conduct has caused him pain, which you have heard will last until the day he dies. He would do anything to relieve the severe, unrelenting pain that he experiences every day as a result of the defendant's conduct. Unfortunately, not even the pain medication he takes will allow him to be pain-free. As a result of the defendant's conduct, he has been given a lifetime prescription of pain. Just attempts to try to make the jury understand what a huge loss this is. Suffering is different than pain. Pain is something we all know. Pain is a part to the hand, to the leg. Suffering is different from pain. Suffering is always there. Suffering is in the mind. It comes from the knowledge that he will never be able to do all those things again. Suffering is the knowledge that he can never play with his kids and the knowledge that he can never be a father to them. Suffering is looking at his wife and knowing he can never be a husband to her. Suffering is the fear that if anything ever happens to him, he cannot get out of the way. And worse, that he cannot get his family out of the way of danger and he never will be able to do for the 40 years over his life expectancy. I'd now like to move on to loss of life's pleasures and embarrassment and humiliation. We spend a lot of time with uh, and great thought in deciding what loss of life's pleasures to present um, in front of the jury and a lot of times, obviously, embarrassment and humiliation goes with that. Everyone wants to live life to the fullest. Weekends, family fun, activities, children, grandchildren, all the things they can no longer do. All important to bring out in direct examination and then to decide what to use in uh, closing. Because with a significant injury, most cases, you have those type of things that are affected. And those are things that, in my opinion, any jury could understand that it would be a very uh, significant loss. 
You heard from Mr. Jones' family members who told you oftentimes in tears all the things their dad and husband can no longer do. Those things this proud man took so much enjoyment in doing. Everything has changed for Mr. Jones and his family. No more weekend barbecues with him cooking. No more fishing with his sons or playing softball with his daughters. These loss of life's pleasures have been stripped for Mr. Jones forever, not just in the last three years, but forever. Only you can place a value on these tremendous losses. Only you can place a value on the heartache this man has suffered and will continue to suffer in not being able to do these things with his family. Next item of damage. Again, on the verdict sheet, embarrassment and humiliation, loss of pride, loss of ability to be self-sufficient, disfigurement, I guess it goes without saying. And you don't have to say a lot, but again, another line, another item of damage. And it sure is an everyday reminder of the horror. Scar might not cause pain and suffering on an everyday basis, but when your client gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, and sees a scar on their face or a scar on another part of their body, how could anyone argue that it isn't a constant reminder of what happened to them?